Okay, students, this is the video lecture for um, chapter, I look like I'm in a police interrogation, right? If I do that. Um, this is chapter five, which is a continuation of chapter four. Chapter four was about libel. Uh, this is about the different defenses that can be invoked to uh, defend oneself against a libel claim. Chapter five, the case for the defense, JMS 494. Um, I mentioned in the last lecture that the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove uh, a, a case of libel. Uh, the situation is really stacked towards uh, media outlets because there are a variety of defenses that can be used. And if you are defending yourself against a libel claim, you only have to be victorious on one of these. Right, you only have to be successful with one reason. You don't have to be successful on all. Um, truth is the best defense. If someone says you have defamed me in your publication, uh, if you can show that it's true or substantially true, that's the best, the best defense right there. But here are some other elements that uh, can be invoked: uh, that you did thorough investigation, um, you did you know careful, systematic, and painstaking reporting. Um, other things, I'm not going to read all of these. They're in the lecture notes. If y'all have made it this far in college, I assume you can read. Uh, but these are some different defenses that are invoked. And first, I'm going to talk about slap. Two zip came to 11. Hey, you're pretty good at this for a beginner. Natural athlete. What's the game I want in? <laughs> nice job. No, not that kind of slap. What we're talking about here is a strategic lawsuit against public participation, commonly known as SLAP. A uh, SLAP is what we refer to as, um, sometimes a corporation will basically just use its powerful lawyers to silence a media outlet. Uh, bringing a libel case against a newspaper or a media outlet simply to shut them up. Uh, when there's no merits to the case at all, but you just want to basically threaten someone with powerful lawyers. In 29 states here, indicated here in this map, 29 states um, have some type of anti-slap protection, including District of Columbia and Guam. And what this means is that if you bring a libel case against a media outlet, I'm looking at my notes, um, if you bring a libel case against some type of media outlet and the courts find it without merit, then you could be penalized. The corporation, I'm just gonna use the corporation as an example. A corporation could be penalized and have to pay all the legal fees, even the legal fees against the person that you're trying to sue. Um, basically, this is to discourage frivolous lawsuits and also to discourage big corporations like let's just say McDonald's, for example, uh, at McDonald's threatened to sue everyone who said anything negative about them uh, that would skew the press coverage. And the courts want to prevent that. They want to prevent uh, people with a lot of money from just, you know, basically steamrolling other people. Other people, now it seems like, you know, anti-slap protection makes sense and anti-slap laws make sense, but there are some people who believe that it actually interferes with uh, federal rules of civil procedure and that uh, it's an interference and that these anti-slap provisions should not exist. Now, this is a big one. It's called the fair report privilege. Uh, if information comes from an official meeting or official proceeding of some type, um, like say you're covering a city hall meeting and something is said there that proves to be untrue and defames someone, if you are a reporter with your notebook, um, yes, I believe you still should use notebooks uh, in case your phone dies. Um, you know, you're taking notes and then you report what was said. You, as the reporter, uh, are not going to be responsible because you were just doing what is called fair reporting. <clears throat> this covers uh, any kind of like government proceeding, um, media accounts of judicial proceedings. Uh, if someone in law enforcement says something, uh, you can cover all of that. Um, even private individuals communicating with the government and you somehow report on that, you know, so-and-so said this, you're okay, right? Uh, this relates to determining who's at fault. And if you are a journalist reporting what was said in an official government meeting, you are not responsible. These uh, instances of fair report are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, 
they're upheld often, uh, upheld often, and um, and they're really crucial so that journalists can report on government proceedings. Um, I'm reading here for some notes. Um, law enforcement agencies are also covered. Uh, for example, just for my notes, I think this from the textbook originally. Uh, a former Belleville, Illinois police chief sued the local newspaper for libel after the newspaper reported that he was a subject of a rape investigation. Uh, a three-judge panel determined that no, he was in fact the subject of a rape investigation. Um, you know, journalists had just reported that. They didn't say he was a rapist, but that he was the subject of a rape investigation. However, not every statement, this is a big distinction, not every statement by a police officer is covered by fair report. Um, one state Supreme Court, for example, refused to apply the fair report privilege to statements made by a police officer to a reporter during an interview. Um, the courts determined that the interview with the reporter was not part of whatever the police officer's official job was, that that was more of a personal statement that that person was making. So not everything that comes from a police officer is covered by fair report privilege. Now, when it comes to opinion, we have something now called the Ullman test, the Ullman test. Okay, here are the questions that the court looks at to determine uh, if something is opinion or fact. I, I said in the last lecture that this can be a gray area. Um, here's from the textbook. Uh, in 1978, after having his offer of chairmanship of the government department at the University of Maryland College Park rescinded, Ullman sued columnists Robert Novak and Roland Evans. Okay, these are columnists. Novak and Evans were columnists uh, writing for some type of publication. He said they libeled him. Uh, they quoted some other uh, professors anonymously, said that, you know, Ullman was a Marxist. Um, he indoctrinates students. And Ullman basically uh, lost this, you know, prestigious job he had, he had uh, been given. So he sues for libel. The courts found that no, what um, Novak and Evans had written in their column was in fact an opinion. So therefore uh, they could not be held responsible for libel. I think I mentioned this before, just to repeat letters to the editor and online comments are typically viewed as expression of opinion. Um, this is a letter um, that I uh, found in the New York Post. Uh, this was a very corrupt politician. Uh, it was an elderly gentleman, pretty old. Uh, had been given a long, long prison sentence and was released after eight months. Um, and the letter says, you know, slippery, this appeared in the New York Post, slippery Shelley Silver is out, one of the most corrupt politicians in New York history. Um, that's an opinion, you know, Shelley Silver, uh, if he wanted to sue for libel, he wouldn't be able to because that's clearly an opinion. Now, this one you might find interesting. I, I assume uh, Jerry Seinfeld is still Still in your memory, I think you know who Jerry Seinfeld was. He appeared on the David Letterman show. Uh, what date was that? Uh, October 7th, 2007. October 7th, 2007. And um, Seinfeld's wife had written a book about how to get kids to eat healthy. And I think there was something about slipping carrots and peas into mashed potatoes or something like that. How to get kids to eat healthy food. Well, this other woman had already written a book about how to get kids to eat healthy foods and uh, was accusing, I think, Seinfeld's wife of being a plagiarist and ripping off her idea. And Seinfeld on David Letterman says she is the other woman, the woman who did the first cookbook was a wacko and a nut job, a wacko and a nut job. Pretty negative things to say about someone, especially on national television, you know, a uh, David Letterman show. Um, that was a late night talk show in case you don't know. Uh, the woman sues and, uh, you know, saying Seinfeld libeled her and the courts again said, no, nah, it was just a matter of opinion. Uh, it was just a comment he made on a late night talk show. Um, it wasn't a statement of fact, it was an opinion. Now this case is pretty famous, uh, Hustler Magazine v. Falwell. Um, Hustler Magazine, I don't even know if it still exists, uh, but when it did exist, it was rather adult content, okay? So I have heard. Other people have told me it was rather adult content, um, really vulgar. We're not talking about aesthetic, uh, topless women in, in sort of um, in a soft focus. This is quite raunchy material. 
Um, Jerry Falwell was a very, very famous uh, TV preacher, uh, evangelical e evangelist. Um, Hustler prints this uh, parody about him, Campari Liquor, had a series of ads at the time about my first time, my first time having Campari. Um, in Hustler's version, they say Jerry Falwell, this you know very famous preacher, his first time uh, having sexual relations was with his mother in an outhouse, which is a rather offensive thing to say. And um, he again sues for libel. Uh, the publisher gets off. Uh, the courts say this was rhetorical hyperbole and no one in their right mind would assume anything in Hustler was factual. Like no one, in, no one reading Hustler would possibly assume that that was true. And again, we, I get back to the element of Falwell being a public figure. So the standards for him to sue for libel um, were much, much higher than the average person. Now, this is something that's probably been discussed in other, uh, other classes you have, especially if you are a JMS major. Um, Section 230, this is part of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, it basically says if you are an ISP, internet service provider, or a social media platform, you are immune from libel claims. You uh, cannot be, in not every instance, but in, in, in many instances, in many instances, uh, you will not be held responsible. Now, when does this apply? Um, if you are, hold on, put my notes here. If you function as a content distributor primarily, not as a content creator or not as a publisher, that means if you publish everything or all the messages that come into your site, uh, without qualifying them, without ranking them, without altering them, um, then you're not really a publisher. You're just an open forum. So the internet service provider or platform is not responsible for those messages. And then um, if you don't interact directly with the content in some way. Now, this Section 230 has been applied very, very, very broadly. Um, even ISPs and platforms that encourage people to send in, um, even if they work with third parties, uh, even if there's you know drop down menus to facilitate where people post information, um, Section 230 has been applied. So it's been applied very, very, very broadly. And at the time of this recording, uh, there's a lot of chatter and there's some politicians, I think on both sides of the aisle, who want to change Section 230 uh, to hold uh, online companies responsible for the information that appears on that platform. Um, it remains to be seen if that will happen or not. Uh, I just want to pull out for a moment and show this one website. It's called The Dirty. Um, it does not show up in Google rankings, but if you type in thedirty.com, it does show up and it, uh, I'll show it to you. This is one of those trash talk websites where people uh, send in information they want to trash talk people. Um, and courts have found that Section 230 even applies to this site, even though the headlines and things are put, put in by whoever publishes this site. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, that's clearly a negative thing to say about someone. Um, so the headline was added by this website, but they're still saying that Section 230 applies. Oh, here we have someone who's a hood rat. So I, I just bring this up not because I want to look at this kind of uh, content, um, but just because to say this is a variety of ways that Section 230 has been applied. Now we come to something called the wire service defense. The wire service defense. This goes back quite, quite a bit, quite a ways. And um, it actually goes back to the era of the telegraph, the late 1800s. Um, the idea is that if you say you're a media outlet, let's say newspaper, right? Because we're talking back in the day and you subscribe to one of these wire services. These are entities like the Associated Press. Uh, there was also United Press International and we have Reuters as well. Um, you're a media outlet. You subscribe to one of these services and then you get a steady stream of news, little cryptic bits of news so that you do not have to go out and do original reporting, especially if it's something that happens far away from your locale, like you were a newspaper in San Diego, how would you possibly know about an earthquake in China or a fire you know, in Europe or something like that? So you get these little bit tidbits of information. And uh, just as a little, a little bit of history, um, when I was coming up, I worked at a campus radio station, University of Georgia in the late 1980s. I think I started in 1980. 
86 or 87, I don't know. Um, we had a machine like this and, and they were very, very common in, in newsrooms, radio stations, TV stations, uh, newspapers, any place that reported news. This machine would constantly be running called like a wire machine. Uh, and it was, uh, oh, teletype. Yeah, I think it's actually technically known as a teletype machine. It made a very distinctive sound and it was constantly running. The sound is this. The idea was that there's this roll of paper constantly coming out, just a steady stream of, of news. And there is a derogatory term for lazy journalists or lazy reporters. You just go over to this machine, rip, off a piece of the news and then read it right you know you could just go on the radio and just read it directly um rip and read uh is, is what that sort of uh, type of reporting was called okay anyway so the wire service defense goes back to the era of the telegraph the idea is that if you are a media outlet and you're subscribing to one of these services and information comes over the wire uh right we're talking about telegraph now it goes over the wire and that information happens to be false, defamatory, libelous. If you report it, you should not be responsible or you should not be fully responsible. Uh, the idea being, hey, I trust the Associated Press. I'm just reporting what the Associated Press said. Um, and many, many newspapers subscribe to these services, especially in the era of the Telegraph. There are a couple of uh, aspects that must be true to invoke the wire service defense, okay? A couple of aspects that must be true to invoke the wire service defense. Um, if the original source was a reputable news gathering agency, let's say the Associated Press, very reputable. If the defendant did not know the story was false, right? If you are a newspaper and you didn't know the story was false and there was nothing that prompted that it may have been incorrect. There's no red flags. There's nothing about it that makes it seem fishy. And if the original wire service story was republished without substantial change, if you basically just took it and reported it the way it came in, then you can invoke the wire service defense. Uh, I listened recently to a really, really good podcast that was about this topic and uh, some famous libel cases uh from you know decades if not 100 years ago this one really caught my eye this one really caught my eye i thought this was very very interesting annie oakley was a very famous uh shooter a marksman right a wild and she performed in wild west shows these were shows where people would sort of reenact old western fights and do rodeo tricks and things like that and uh, she was internationally famous uh, she was you know said to be you know the best marksman that's even a sexist term. Let's say she was the best shooter. I, I, yeah, let's say that, not sexist term. She was the best shooter. Uh, so by 1904, she was incredibly famous, incredibly famous, you know, uh, literally an international celebrity. I don't know why there's not a movie about her. She sounds like a great story. In 1904, uh, this woman who was an Annie Oakley impersonator, I guess, you know, 120 years ago, you could get away with that and people couldn't just look up a photo online. This woman was touring the country, was an Annie Oakley impersonator. Um, she was a bit of a degenerate, the, 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 the impersonator. The impersonator was a degenerate. In 1904, the story comes out on one of the wire services that Annie Oakley uh, had stolen a man's pants in order to buy cocaine. I repeat, she had stolen a man's pants in order to buy cocaine uh, when Annie Oakley it was not true. It was totally not true. It was not the real Annie Oakley. When, when Annie Oakley finds out about this, uh, she tours the country and files, you know, over 50 something. I don't know how many, but many, many. She went to every newspaper that had, she could that had published the story. And they all claimed, look, we got it from this wire service. We got it from this wire service. And she did win some money, but she actually won less than her legal fees. So uh, this shows kind of the evolution of the wire service defense. Uh, I think today, if something bizarre like that happened, I, I think, you know, uh, those newspapers would get off scot-free. But anyway, I thought that was a really bizarre, interesting historical anecdote. And there are some other defenses. There's a single publication rule. This is explained in the textbook. And then perhaps my favorite is the libel proof plaintiff defense. 
the libel proof plaintiff defense, which basically states someone's reputation is so bad, someone has such a poor reputation to begin with, that nothing the media reports could possibly damage that person's reputation anymore. Um, I thought that was just an interesting, interesting concept, the libel proof plaintiff. Okay, wrapping up, that's the video lecture for chapter five, different defenses that can be invoked uh, if a media outlet is accused of libel. That's it.